if you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 965 and you will find the text. Uh, and also, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, please take one of those with you. This is our gift to you. And we're serious about that because we want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. So, uh, hey, before I dive in, let me just uh, mention uh, a couple of things that you may be interested in. Uh, the first one is just simply a, a, uh, an aside, because I know a lot of you love to hear Pastor Chet preach, and he's going to be preaching at McCulloch right after this service uh, at 9, 30, and 11, so you can, you know, go right from here, because you don't have life group right now. You can go right here, and you can go worship again with him over at McCulloch campus, uh, and, uh, or, and, and hear it right, uh, and... Uh, uh, well, that's, hey, I, I can get away with that. Or you can, go to brunch, you can go to breakfast and then go hear him at 11 o'clock at McCulloch. I'm just saying it, it's, a, it, it's a morning where you can, you can do that. So, because some of you say, how come Pastor Chet doesn't preach? He does. He just doesn't, isn't here. So uh, you can go hear him there. The other thing is you may have noticed a table when you came in. If you came in through the main lobby, uh, there's a table set up there. Uh, Pastor Jared Onserio from Nairobi, Kenya is with us today. He's uh, uh, we came across his path through Celebrate Recovery. Pastor Ted met him uh, last year at Celebrate Recovery Summit over at Saddleback Church. I met him uh, then in October when I was in Kenya uh, teaching. He was at the conference that I spoke at. And uh, he gave me a tour of his church and his school that are in uh, one of the largest slums in Africa. And, and so uh, he's on his way to Celebrate Recovery Summit again. And, uh, and so he stopped by. He's going to be speaking tomorrow night at CR, Celebrate Recovery, at the McCulloch Campus at 6.30. He's got a great story. You may want to go and hear about his story and about his ministry. But, uh, but he brought some jewelry from, uh, that the ladies in his church have made. And, uh, and he's offering it to us, to anyone who wants it. And by the way, here's, here's how we do that. That jewelry is free. Uh, but we're asking for donations for his ministry. And uh, so you can give it to him. Uh, you can make it out if you want to do a check you can, or donate online. You can make it out to Calvary. Just put Kenya Mission on it. We'll get the money to him. Uh, and uh, and he's, uh, he's, again, he's got a great story. He's got a great heart for God. I love his passion for people and for helping them to grow in Christ. And, and he is a huge fan like we are of Celebrate Recovery because all of us are broken and all of us need help. So uh, that's, uh, that's what's going on. I hope you'll go back there. And uh, as I told him, I said, my goal is for us to clean you out of all your stuff this weekend. We just want, we just want to, you don't have to lug it around anymore and pay that extra luggage fee and stuff. So how many of you ever worry? Oh, oh, look at that. Hands go up. How many of you say you worry too much? Okay, there's some, there's some hands that go up there. Okay, so, so what do we worry about? Do we, do we worry about money? Do we worry about paying bills and buying groceries and saving for retirement or whether our retirement money is going to last? Do we worry about college for kids or grandkids? Do you worry about your health? Will I get sick? Will I get well ever again? Uh, will, you know, what's the, what's the exit process going to be when the time comes from this world? You know, is it going to be painful? Is it going to be quick? Uh, you know, some of you, uh, I know, like to live on, like, WebMD, checking out the disease of the day, you know, feeding your hypochondria. But... Uh, what do you worry about? Do you worry about your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, their, their safety, their health, their, their schooling, their future, their career, their success, or maybe their failure? Because maybe they're struggling with depression or, or uh, they're you know, struggling with addiction or just uh, life in general. Or maybe you, you worry about the world. You know, uh, are we going to get sucked into another war, uh, about the economy, about terrorism? Maybe you're worried about the next election. You see, we're a nation of worriers. In fact, you could say that, you know, worry is becoming uh, a national pastime. Uh, here's some statistics from the National Institute of Health. 17 million Americans suffer from depression. That's 7% of adults. 13% of teenagers struggle with depression. Uh, but anxiety gets even more uh, of us. 40 million Americans suffer from anxiety. That's uh, about 19% of adults. One in five adults you meet is struggling with anxiety, debilitating anxiety, you know, the kind that's diagnosed and treated. But get this, 31% of teenagers are struggling with anxiety. 
one in three of our teenagers is overwhelmed with anxiety uh, about life and about their situation. So uh, I just want you to know, if you struggle with depression or anxiety, we want to help. So we've got counseling available. Uh, if you're on medications, please follow your doctor's directions uh, and, and prescriptions. We want to encourage you in that. And we want you to know that we all worry. We all have to deal with anxiety. And Jesus speaks to this issue clearly, boldly, directly in uh, this passage in Matthew chapter 6, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And if we take his words and apply them to our lives, it really can turn our lives upside down. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." So did you hear Jesus? He, he told us, don't be anxious. Don't worry. Now we can all stop worrying and be at peace, right? Is that how that worked work for you? That doesn't really work for any of us. huh? So let's look at this passage and try and understand why and how Jesus says not to worry. Not to worry. Because what Jesus is doing in this passage is really he's inviting us to trust him. Jesus is inviting you and me the people who are listening to him, to trust him. Now, by the way, Jesus is addressing people who primarily live in poverty. So he's talking about food and clothing because they needed food and clothing. If he was talking to us today, he might use other examples because none of us need food, none of us need clothing. We have more food than we should, which is why we're always dieting and trying to lose weight and doing all that kind of stuff, because we've got too much food. And then when it comes to clothing, we've all got too much clothing, right? Because you, how many times have you said, I don't know what to wear, or I don't have a thing to wear while you're staring at a closet full of clothes? <laughs> so the people that Jesus is talking to are subsistence farmers. They, they didn't own any land, but they went and they worked the land. They got a day's uh, wages for their work. They took that money. They bought food for their family. If they worked, they ate. If they didn't work, they didn't eat. That's how that worked. So they were really desperate for food. And, and clothing, they, you know, the average uh, Jewish family at the time, each person would have two undergarments and one outer garment. Not a lot of struggle to figure out what to wear. But if it wore out, you were in need. And so they worried about, where, you know, is my cloak going to last? Is my outer garment going to last? Am I going to be able to stay warm? Am I going to be able to stay healthy? And, and so Jesus knows their concerns, and he says, look, God cares for you, so trust him. And, and by the way, Jesus po also pointed out the complete uselessness of worry, right? Does worry or anxiety add a single hour to your life? No, it doesn't change anything. In fact, let's be honest, does worry or anxiety change anything for the better? No, it really doesn't. So we know that, and Jesus invites us to trust him. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, let's be really clear about what that means. If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, it's personal, that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ as Lord, as Savior with your life, then you already have made a decision to trust Jesus. You've made a decision to trust him to forgive you of your sins, 
to, to take care of you when you die, to take you to heaven, give you eternal life, adopt you as, his, as part of his family. You're already trusting him to do all of that. So why not trust him with day-to-day -day life? Why not trust God? So Jesus wants us to trust him not only with our, you know, eternity, but he wants us to trust him with the unknown. Trust him with the unknown, with the outcomes, with the future. See, God knows the future. We do not. And that drives some of us crazy because we're so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to happen with this relationship? What's going to happen with this situation? What's going to happen with the country? What's going to happen with the world? And we get so anxious about what's going to happen when we have zero control over what's going to happen. And we don't know what's going to happen, but God does know what's going to happen. And God says, trust me. Trust me. Come on, trust me. Go ahead and trust me with the future. Trust me. I, I, I've been there. I've seen it. We win. Go ahead and trust me. But we, we want to know what's going to happen, and we agonize over it, and we think about it, and, and, and we try to figure it out. And see, here's the thing. We think we want to know the future. Right? We think we want to know the future. Because, you know, what we really want to know is, you know, what are the future lottery numbers? Or, you know, what is the future of this? And, and, and the truth is, we really don't want to know the future. I mean, a lot of us go, well, I want to know how long I have. Really? Because if you knew your death day, it'd freak you out. Okay? It really would. I don't care when it is. It'd freak you out. And, and God doesn't tell us those things. And by the way, the, the desire to know the future is natural. The disciples expressed that after the resurrection, Right? Lord, is now the time that you're going to, you know, install the kingdom and, and bring about, is now, is it, is it going to happen? When's it? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. And what did he say? Be ready and be my servant. Be ready and be my servant. He didn't, he didn't say, oh, here, let me give you some hints or clues or whatever. You know, and by the way, that's why things like horoscopes, and fortune telling and palm reading and seances and all that kind of stuff are offensive to God. They're offensive to God because by doing those things, people are trying to figure out the future. What's going to happen? What should I do? How should I do it? And God says, no, don't worry about any of that kind of stuff. Just trust me. Trust me. I've promised you a future, so go ahead and trust me. So, God desires that we trust him to lead us. And when, you know, we disobey and our life crashes, whether it's, you know, because we're our rebellion or somebody else's rebellion, trust him to redeem our lives, to heal and restore our lives. He wants us to trust him with the future. And, and by the way, uh, this is one of those things, too, that Jesus references when he says, by worrying, can you add one hour to your life? No. You can't. So here's the, here's the reality. You and I can't control outcomes, which is what we worry about, I think, the most. What's going to happen with this situation? What's going to happen with my job? What's going to happen with my health? What's going to happen with my kids? What's going to happen? We can't control the outcomes. You know what we can control? Our choices. We can control our choices our attitude and our actions. And so can I just encourage you, no matter what your situation you're facing, uh, would you just choose to live out the character of Jesus? Would you just choose to love and encourage and bless and forgive and, and be gracious and kind? Because the, you can't go wrong with that. And if you'll live out the character of Christ and trust God with the outcomes, uh, God will redeem. So trust Jesus with the unknown. Jesus invites us to trust him with our possessions. With our stuff, right? Because all this is about stuff. It's about food. It's about clothing. It's about stuff. And, and let's be honest, we worry about stuff. We worry about getting stuff, having enough stuff, losing stuff. That's why our garages have outgrown our houses. <clears throat> we care more about our stuff than uh, sometimes about the people because we've got more room for the stuff than the people now. We don't want anyone to steal it, so we've got to build a bigger garage so we can put it inside, lock it up, make sure nobody can get it, and, and take it away. And uh, Jesus says, look, God clothes the flowers of the field. Right? He, he dresses them better than Solomon in all of his glory. Solomon was the richest king of Israel uh, that I ever knew. So he says, they're clothed better than Solomon. And by the way, what he's calling flowers, we would call weeds. Right? 
Because, I mean, let's be honest, uh, you know, a field full of scorpion weed, you know, would look really pretty, but none of us want to go there. We want to kill those things. And God says, look, I clothe the weeds, the flowers. All right, call them what you want. And, and Jesus says, look, God feeds the stupid birds. If he's taking care of the stupid birds, who, by the way, he's calling them, you know, freeloading, you know, feathered friends because he's like, they don't sow, they don't reap, they, don't, they, just, they just eat. They're all good. If God's taking care of the stupid birds, don't you think he's going to take care of you? I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. Look, don't worry about this stuff. Trust God. God's going to take care of you. And by the way, if you're really anxious about money and stuff and all of that, can I just encourage you to listen to the message from last week? You can go to calvarylhc.com, uh, go to sermons, and you can l listen to that sermon or any other sermon that uh, we've had here. Uh, because Jesus talks about our addiction to stuff and about our priorities and, and how we can prioritize the right things. So Jesus invites us to trust him with the unknown, with our possessions. He invites us to trust him with our relationships. The people in our lives, our spouse, our children, our, our grandchildren, our parents. And if we listen to Jesus and apply what he says, he teaches us how to love our family. He teaches us how to love our neighbors. He teaches us how to love even our enemies. Uh, in fact, I was, I was thinking about this. You know why God tells us to love so often in Scripture? I mean, it's like, you know, if you're reading the New Testament, it's like every other paragraph is like love people and do this and love them better. And, uh, I, I think it's because we're so bad at it. I mean, it's God's priority, but we're not good at it. We're naturally not really all that good at, at really loving people. And so God's always saying, hey, love them like I loved you. Love them. That everyone's going to know you're my disciples if you love one another. Hey, love one another. Like I, it just, he just over and over and over again, he emphasizes this, this thing about relationships because he knows that our tendency is to try to control people instead to lo of loving people. Now, you might go, oh, that's not me, really. Every single parent on the face of the earth, I think at some point, has beat their head against the wall thinking, I could just choose so much better than my kids are choosing right now. I could make, if they would just listen to me. And a lot of times we try and control the outcomes of the decisions of the people that we say that we love. Henry Nouwen, one of my favorite authors, says, it's easier to control people than to love people. And, and we lean toward the control, right? Sometimes we, you know, use guilt. I'm not saying moms do that better than dads, but sometimes we use guilt, right? Sometimes we try to use money, you know, as an incentive, which is control. They have strings attached. It's control. It's not a gift. And, and see, here's the reality. God's our Father, and God loves us, and God doesn't control us. Or manipulate us. You know, he could control us. He's God. But he gives us freedom and he trusts us. He just loves us. He invites us to life. He invites us to health. He invites us to blessings. But he also uh, gives us that freedom to not choose that. Now, he grieves when we choose rebellion and pain because rebellion always leads to pain. But he just keeps loving us and, and forgiving us and, and holding out hope that we'll come home. So can we trust Jesus to care for our kids and our grandkids? Can we trust Jesus to care for our spouse or our parents? Will we trust Jesus enough to follow his example and love like he loves? Uh, you know, I, I, I got this soapbox that the older I get... Uh, uh, the more powerful I realize our blessings are. And, and I know, uh, I'll, you know, the older we get, the less we're physically able to do the stuff we used to do. And sometimes we start feeling like, oh, I just can't do anything. What's my point? What's my purpose? Can I just tell you that as long as you have breath and sanity, you have the ability to bless people. You have the ability to bless your children. You have the ability to bless your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, if God gives you those. You have the ability to bless in a powerful way. Can I just encourage you to go out with a smile on your face and blessings on your lips? Just resolve that. 
And, and if you don't know how to bless your kids or your grandkids, uh, sit down with somebody who has a much more positive attitude and listen to them, talk with them, ask them what they do, and, and let them kind of coach you and help you figure out what that looks like. Because Jesus invites us to trust Him with our relationships. So Jesus wants us to trust Him, but we need to understand that trust is active, not passive. Trust, trust is active. Uh, a lot of times people think that trusting God means doing nothing. I, I get that feeling growing up in church a lot of times. It was like, oh, we just got to trust God, which equated to let's just sit back and wait for God to rescue us. Let's just sit back and wait for God to do something. Trust, you know, kind of was implied that it was a passive thing. And, and as I read Scripture, I don't think that's really the essence of trust. If, if you read the Bible, you see that trust involves action. It's active voice. Think about it. Think about all the people that you read about in the Bible. If you go back to the book of Genesis, there's this guy named Abraham. He's the father of Israel, and he's the father of all people of faith. And God says to Abraham, hey, I want you to move. Pack up your family and move. And he's like, where, where am I going to go, God? And he's like, I'll tell you when you get there. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I'd be inclined to say, God, as soon as you tell me, I'll leave. Right? That's passive. Abraham packs up the stuff, starts moving. And God shows him the land that he's going to give to his descendants. That's active faith. That's active trust. Or what about Moses? God called Moses, you can read about him in the book of Exodus, to lead the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt to freedom. And, and Moses was 80 years old when God gave him this assignment. Can you just imagine, you know, God's like, hey, Moses, I want you to do this. And Moses is like, God, I'm kind of thinking about retirement. I've been saving up some extra sheep. I got a wife, kids. I'm settled down. I'm kind of comfortable here. I, I've already done my time. I've already worked hard. I've already served. Can I just have a pass on this? Nope. And so what did Moses do? He went and he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. You think that's how he wanted to spend his last 40 years? I don't. But he did it. Because he trusted God that his plan was better. Or what about David? David's the other in the spectrum. He's a young kid. He's not even old enough to, you know, uh, go and fight with his brothers. He just takes some supplies and God says, I want you to kill a giant. David's like, let's do this. I'll trust God in the active voice. I'm going to trust God to do this because God used him to do it. Or what about the disciples? Jesus is walking along. They're working. They're fishing. And Jesus says, follow me. I would want more details. Come on, uh, where are we going to go, Jesus? How long are we going to be gone? i got to tell my wife something, you know. And, uh, and what about my job? How's gonna, how am I going to pay the bills? And, and what's going to... Jesus, I'm a fisherman. What am I going to do? You're going to be fishing for men. Let's go. And they went. That is active trust. They, they put their lives where they said their faith was. And, and so for us, what does it look like to actively trust God? It means that, that we're going to follow Jesus. And by the way, you can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. It means change. It means movement. It means applying God's word to our lives, even when it doesn't make any sense. Because let's be honest, a lot of times we read it and we go, that's crazy. Like, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Come on. Really? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Come on, that's, that's insane. Why would we do that? Forgive no matter what they've done to you, but because you've been forgiven? Jesus is waiting. Trust is active, applying it to our lives. It means hearing and obeying Jesus, especially when it's difficult. Especially when it's difficult. See, if, if God calls us to do something we want to do, we're all for it, right? Yay, let's do this. But what about when God calls us to do something we don't want to do? What's your response? Well, I, I'm not really gifted in that area. I don't really want to do that. Can, can I just point out something that's obvious and, and maybe you haven't thought about it? God is calling every single one of us who's a follower of Jesus Christ, who believes that, hey, our sins are forgiven and we're going to heaven when we die. He's calling us to end our lives with faith on our lips. Look, none of us wants to die. We all want heaven, but none of us wants to die to get there. Can, can we just be real honest about that? 
And, and a lot of us worry about that process. What's that process going to look like? And what's it going to involve? And how much is it going to hurt? And, 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 and we're afraid of the unknown. And Jesus is saying, trust me. And that means that as we're walking that process, we talk about the faith we have in God. We talk about the expectation of heaven. We bless people. We, we smile as much as we can. We do it with faith. That's active faith. That's trusting God. It's living out his promises daily. You see, trust is action based on belief. If, you, if you're sick, where do you go? <laughs> you guys don't, oh, I don't go anywhere. We're just, we just sit at home, figure we're going to die anyway. If you're sick, where do you go? Yeah, you go to the doctor. Okay, so you go to the doctor, and if you trust the doctor... You follow their prescriptions, right? You take the meds, you follow their regime, you go to therapy, whatever it is. You, you trust what they say and you follow that because you, you, if you trust them. Now, if you get in legal trouble, where do you go? Yeah, you go to a lawyer. And if you trust the lawyer, you follow his counsel. Okay, what do I need to do? How do I need to do this? Okay, uh, and, and, and you listen to them if you trust them. So if your life is a mess, who should you go to? Yeah, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. But see, a lot of people come to Jesus and they just want him to fix it and they don't have to do anything. But if you're going to trust Jesus, it means you follow his counsel. You follow his wisdom. You apply his teachings to your life. So are you actively trusting Jesus? My guess is your answer is like mine. Yes and no. Sometimes. Sometimes sometimes more than others, but we want to trust him more. So, so let's talk about learning to trust God. Learning to trust God. I want to share four habits that build trust. Now, these are not four magic bullets that if you do them once, everything's going to be hunky-dory. I'm talking about patterns in your life that you build into your life on a daily basis that will grow trust in your life, that will help you to trust God more and more naturally. And the more that you trust God, then uh, the more peace and joy you're going to have in your life. So here's four things, uh, but again, these are about things that you got to build into your life over and over and over again. First of all, I want to encourage you to see God's power. See God's power. Uh, Jesus references God's power when he talks about God providing in all these different ways. So see his power in creation. I mean, like, come on, we live in a beautiful place. Uh, I see the pictures posted of sunsets and sunrises and, and the lake. And, and look, see God's power in nature and the storms and, and, and the weather. See God's power in the beauty that it's around us. See God's power in history. You know, the Old Testament is basically a testimony of God's power of how he established the people and revealed himself and worked in their lives. And story after story of God's miraculous power showing up. See God's power in your life. Can you reflect and identify how God has worked in your life? How God has protected you and provided for you and healed you and rescued you and restored your life? You see, if you can't really do that, and, I, and I'm being absolutely serious, schedule an appointment with me or Chad or one of the other pastors and let us help you to see the, God's power in your life because we can do that. We can help you identify those places along the way where God showed up and, and rescued you and healed you and is calling you. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. But you got to work at it and see that. Because the, here's the thing, the more you intentionally look for God's power, the more you're going to see it. And the more you see God's power, the more you're going to trust him. So if you want to learn to trust God, see God's power. Do it every day. And then secondly, embrace his love. Embrace his love. Uh, we say God loves you a lot. The Bible says God loves you a lot. We tell other people God loves you a lot. But here's a question. On a personal level, do you really, truly, honestly believe every single day that God loves you? That it's personal, that it's real, that you are valuable in the presence of God? Do you remember on a daily basis that God demonstrated his love for you by sending Jesus into this world to be our Savior. In fact, the Apostle John even says this. He goes, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And then, not only that, but God reveals His love in all of our blessings. The Apostle James says that every good and perfect gift comes from God uh, in whom there is no shifting shadow. Okay? 
look, everything in your life is, is evidence, every good thing in your life is evidence that God loves you. And he's blessed you. And, and if you'll thank him for those things, if you'll express that gratitude and you'll remember that Jesus loves you, then it, it's going to help you to trust because when you know that you're loved, it's easier to trust. If you know that somebody is for you, it's easier for you to trust them. So see God's power, embrace his love, hope in God's promise. Hope in God's promise. See, God's promises can change our attitude if we live them. If we live them. And, and uh, here's the thing. I don't know whether you grew up in church and you know lots of God's promises that you ignore or if you're brand new to this whole church thing and you don't know any of God's promises. So I'm going to share two promises with you that are life-changing if you'll hold on to them and hope in them. The first promise is that God is with us. Jesus was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The moment that you confess Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, God the Holy Spirit moves into your life, and he's part of your life, and he's there. And he's there to teach you, and he's there to comfort you, he's there to convict you, he's there to give you strength, uh, he's there to yell at you, and you're about to do something stupid. He's there. And he's promised to never leave you or forsake you. In fact, the Holy Spirit is in you guaranteeing your salvation, that you're going to go to heaven when you die. So that's why we want to know that you've had that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Because if you have, the Holy Spirit's in you. Now, here's the thing. If he's in you, if he's with you, then you're never alone. You're never having to face the world alone. You're never abandoned. You're never forsaken. God is there all the time. And if he's there, guess what he's going to do? He's going to redeem your life. He's going to redeem your situation. He's going to redeem your mistakes. Second promise is the promise of heaven. See, the first promise is God is with us. The second promise really is we're going to be with God. We're going to be with God. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come and take you to be with me that where I am, you will always be. That's kind of a cool promise. Now, here's, the, here's the, the truth. If we, as followers of Jesus, own that promise, if we live that promise, then that changes our attitude about every single day that we live because we realize that it only gets better. I mean, if your life is terrible, it's tragic, it, 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 you know, in a nutshell, it sucks, and you're feeling it, guess what? I got good news for you. It only gets better. It only gets better. You're, you're a joint heir with Jesus. You're going to one day, you're going to reign and you're going to live uh, in heaven and there's going to be no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain or politics and, and all is going to be well. Okay? It's just reality. That's what we have ahead of us. So why in the world are we not living with joy? Why in the world are we not living with courage? Why are we not living out that faith that, that because we trust God with his promise? See, that ought to infuse us so that we can live courageously, so that we can love courageously, so that we can, you know, encourage other people and forgive them because, hey, we're going to heaven and nothing can stop it. I think that's kind of a cool promise. I ought to flavor your attitude every single day. Finally, we got to seek his kingdom. If we're going to grow in trust, then we need to seek the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus concludes this section with, right? Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. All the stuff that we worry about, he'll take care of if we'll seek first his kingdom. See, this is about living on mission. Living with a purpose that is connected to eternity. So Jesus challenges us to invest our lives in building God's kingdom, not our kingdom. And Jesus says that peace comes into our lives when we serve others instead of focusing on ourselves. Now think about that. Because our natural temptation is to be self-focused, self-centered, self-ish. You would think having children would have broken us of that but it doesn't. Jesus is the only one who can break us of that. And as long as we're in these broken bodies, we're still going to be drawn toward being selfish. And Jesus says, look, selfishness makes you anxious. Focusing on the kingdom of God, focusing on others, that's what brings peace into your life because you're connected to a mission that is bigger than yourself. I ask a professional counselor, what do you tell your clients who struggle with anxiety and depression and worry? 
And her answer was, I tell them to focus on others instead of themselves. Focus on others' needs instead of your fears. You see, Jesus is right. And secular counseling follows the, the whole counsel of Scripture. Uh, they're just validating once again that Jesus is right. When we follow Jesus, when we serve others, when we invest our lives in His mission, we grow in peace, we grow in joy, we grow in contentment, and therefore we experience less anxiety, fear, and worry. Now, you may still need your meds, you may still need counseling and support groups and therapy, uh, but you will grow in trusting Jesus more. And in the end, purpose defeats anxiety. So what kind of life are you living? And what kind of life do you want to live? Because Jesus invites us to trust him. Are you going to take the actions that build a life of faith. Let's pray. Father, your word is true and it penetrates our lives. It challenges us where we live because we just confess that we worry about stuff that we have no business worrying about. We're afraid of things that you've already defeated and conquered and declared victory over. And, and we just admit that because we want to be people of faith. We want to trust you more so that we can worry less. So help us to, to see your power. Help us to embrace your love. Help us to live on mission. Uh, God, help us to hold on to your promises because they're life-changing. And we want to grow in faith so that we can bless and so that we can point other people to Jesus as long as you leave us in this world. We love you, but thank you for loving us first and for rescuing us and giving us hope beyond this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.